for that to be right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. We have an exciting presentation and discussion that we'll have today around GA4 and tap clicks. Um, we'll give folks just about maybe 30 seconds or another minute just to make sure we get any folks who are logging in here. So let's give it about another minute. In the meantime, I'd love to remind folks we do have, this is an open discussion. Um, we will have open Q&A. So do take advantage, please, of the Q&A button and um, send us your questions. We'll answer them if we can and if we have time in the live session. Otherwise, any questions that we don't get to, we'll certainly follow up after today's webinar. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, today, you have a whole group of folks who are here to have this discussion with you. So um, I want to introduce you to Brian Butler. Brian is the, the president and owner of SmarTech. SmarTech is a uh, trusted partner of TapClicks, and uh, we consider Brian and his team experts on the topic of GA4. And so, Brian, if you would, say hello. Sure. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to meet you, everyone. Appreciate you all joining in. Um, as, as, as April said, my name is Brian Butler. I am the CEO of Smart Tech, and we do a lot of these stuff that people hate doing, which is usually the GA4 stuff, more complicated data implementations, GTM, Tag Manager kind of stuff. It's, the, it's really kind of where we sit in that whole world. All right. So looking forward to, to continuing the conversation with Brian, but I'd love to introduce myself and the other members here who have joined us today. So uh, my name is April Dozot. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, um, I am the uh, head of our, our global client success team here at TapClick. So it is a pleasure to meet you today. And um, I thank you very much for your business and for joining. I'll pass it over to Dan and we'll get some introductions underway. Hi guys. So yeah, my name is Dan Sambrook. Um, I recently joined TapClicks just over a year ago now, um, coming from an agency background. So kind of joined as GA4 was kicking off with most of you guys. So coming in from that and looking at it from that side of the pond, um, I'm hoping I can help kind of share some insights and with Brian's help as well, be able to guide you guys on how best to use GA4 moving forward. All right. Keep going, team. You can just introduce yourselves. <laughs> I'll jump in next then. Hi, guys. I'm Catherine Gaddy. I am the product manager over data connectors here at TapClix. So G4 is one of my lovely babies. Um, I take very good pride in it. Um, so if you ever have any questions about what's going on there, your CSMs are the ones reaching to me to get those things answered. I've been here for about eight years, so I have pretty good experience into what's going on with these things. Thanks, Catherine. Hi everyone, I am Duncan Brattel, uh, background in, in originally media and client reporting and all the associated uh, challenges to do with the data. And I am a sales engineer here at Tapfix, providing support to the uh, client success managers and the sales team as well. And I'm Angela Hicks, the Director of Education and Training at TapClix. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today um, in this session about GA4. We're going to go through a lot of stuff. <laughs> all right. Indeed, we are. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to dive into GA4, talking a little bit about GA4 versus Universal. Um, we're going to talk about discrepancies, sort of exploring discrepancies, how TapClix tackles data um, using GA4 property data. Um, and then on-demand connectors, huge topic for sure, uncovering the power of TapClix GA4 on-demand. Um, and of course, there are advantages over GA4's UI. So you'll want to listen as we talk through some of that. And then open forum, we're going to go ahead and uh, just answer any questions you have. We'll probably answer some of them sort of as we go, not necessarily wait until the end. The questions tend to fold nicely into the discussion in real time. So um, we'll be answering those as we go, but certainly um, don't hesitate to uh, send your questions in the QA uh, portion of your screen there. So you'll see a button at the bottom, QA, send us your questions. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and stop sharing my screen here and pass it on over to uh, Brian and team uh, and uh, Dan as well. Lovely. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you uh, joining again, as April had mentioned. Um, so one of the things we always talk about with GA versus GA4 is really trying to help people understand the what it is and the why it's there. I think a lot of people don't realize necessarily why Google made the change they made and what the differences are. And especially for the European audience. So I would say GA is kind of the answer to the um, GDPR compliance. It's a lot of situations where Google Ads or Google Analytics, pardon me, had a lot of data in their servers that they needed to basically scrub. And they needed to make sure that that data wasn't necessarily being leveraged anymore. And they had a lot of need where they were trying to understand how is it that we can make sure you're getting the most out of your uh, GA instance and your GA experience. And so with that, they wanted to kind of redesign how they needed to have Google Analytics work so that it could be a cookie-less environment and not depend on third-party cookies. Um, for those of you who may not realize, third-party cookies are starting to be deprecated here in 2024. Um, Google Chrome has going to be basically taking the first 1% of all third-party cookies and deprecating them in January. <clears throat> and if you haven't done enhanced conversions yet in Google Ads, if you haven't set up your GA4, it's going to have a significant impact in your conversion volume. Going into Q3 and Q2 of 2024, third-party cookies are going to be deprecated from Chrome completely. And Safari has already started this process. So it's really important that that third-party cookie, uh, cookie-less environment is being represented. And that's what GA4 is really trying to do here, is give you the opportunity to have an environment, have a system that doesn't necessarily have um, the limitations when the cookie-less environment comes in. Um, now, with the, what the differences are, the biggest changes with GA to GA4 um, is going to be how it looks at data. So Google Analytics, as a, as a basic tool, used to look at sessions. Those sessions would be grouped into different user interactions. And when the website was given you know, 30 minutes of time on site, if that user were inactive, that cookie would, re that, that cookie would reset and that session would reset as well. So that session would then end. And then if you were to come back to the site, you would have a new session start. So within a single day, you could technically have one session represent two or three times that same user came back and engaged. And that was really hard for tracking any kind of events or tracking customer journeys, especially if someone wasn't logged into Google or if their IP address was different, they're on their phone and cross channels <clears throat> became very challenging when it came time to tracking. So with that, you, sessions had that 30 minutes of an activity uh, timeout. It also had to do with uh, timing as far as time of day. If it became midnight, for example, those sessions would change. And then also if someone changes that user source. So again, we talked about going from a phone to a tablet to a computer, all resets that session. And so some of those limitations were really trying to make sure that, you know, you were trying to get as much data as, as a client and trying to track that data's journey without the ability to have kind of an, an always on session that kind of tracks that data set. The difference with GA4 is it is more event based, meaning that if someone comes to the site, instead of being session specific, it is event specific. So every interaction from a page view to a button click is treated as an event by Google Analytics. So this does offer more granularity when it comes to creating your own custom funnels and your own custom views as far as how people engage with certain parts of your site. Um, the other benefit here is that you do get the automatic session tracking. So while GA4 is, again, event-centric, it will automatically track sessions. However, the criteria are different. Sessions in GA4 start when a user first engages with the site and ends after 30 minutes of an activity, similar to UA. But GA4 also considers the session to end after 480 minutes, so eight hours of continuous activity, even if there is no activity. So some of the baseline there is that if you are a user, for example, and you have taken action on the site, Maybe you're reading material, or maybe you're on one of Angela's wonderful learning courses on Taplix Academy, right? You want to be able to understand when that user is going through Taplix Academy and takes another step and goes to another course. And if that 30-minute timeout were to engage, then Angela's data would not be near as clean as far as tracking people who are going through the, uh, the, you know, the, the training modules and how long is it taking them to complete the training modules and so on. So if you have a site that has long form content and people have to engage for a while, it's not just a one and done or transactional site, this new uh, functionality within GA4 can be really helpful in really understanding how that data works. But that was the basic understanding as far as the main differences between 
uh, UA and UA, GA4 and really the compliance needed so that Google Analytics can kind of have its way um, of working within that compliance requirement and not having a lot of data be backed up in their servers. Now, I will say if you are interested in the older model of GA, uh, you can sign up for GA360, which is about $12,500 a month or 125,000 a year. And their system is gonna be able to go through and keep some of the similar functions you used to have while also accounting for any of the GDPR compliance. So if you do wanna uh, take a look at the premium version, uh, you have a, an extra $125,000 lying around, feel free, it is available still. <clears throat> All right, so um, I don't, Brian, sorry, you, you you paused to take a drink. Can I chime in, or are you please do? Right? Okay, no, no please, please right. do. Yeah, I was trying. I was trying to give you a uh, give you an, an in to ask a. a All right, awesome, awesome. So, um, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that some of our customers face today with respect to making this overall migration? Um, I would say one, understanding what why they need to make it and understanding that the system's already kind of made the choice for you. If you haven't touched it, it's already kind of done some of that. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities where people can go in and customize GA4, um, making sure their audiences are transferred over from the previous instance, making sure your, um, your traffic exclusions or your referral exclusions are actually added to the new GA4 instance. Those don't transfer over naturally. Um, and then I would say the other biggest biggest challenge is trying to understand how to navigate it. Because unlike tap clicks, which is very intuitive, uh, GA4 is not intuitive. It's not intuitive in any way, shape, or form. But it's gotten better over the last, you know, what, nine months now that it's been starting to really kind of take priority. So the good thing is Google's making, uh, making changes and practical changes. But it's still not as user uh, friendly as uh, our standard instance, right, that we work with in tap clicks every day. Um, so I would say the really the big thing there is trying to recognize there's a lot you can do in GA4 through the API and through the tap clicks um, connection and what the value comes in with that. Because really what you guys bring to the table with that allows a very simplistic, um, intuitive and easy to engage version of GA4. You don't have to necessarily deal with the very clunky of report builder that GA4 has built in now. Okay. And Brian, we, you talked there about user interface. Would you say there's a significant difference between the way that measurement is taken, the way that we take, the way that we do measurement, sorry, across GA4 and GAUA in terms Definitely. of sessions, events? What's what's the key differences there? Yeah, I would say that the big difference is that if you can think about it in, in layman's terms, GAUA was static, whereas GA4 is dynamic. What I mean by that is like, if you look at the look back window, right? So a consumer comes into the website on, let's call it the 1st of November. They come into your website and they read an article and they leave. Then they come back in on the 5th and they take another action where they're maybe looking at your store. By the 10th, they're finally ready to buy and they make a purchase. Well, Google Analytics, unless that action was maybe a Google ad uh, within the last seven days, Everything is going to get sent to basically direct um, and the uh, it's called direct not set unless that click from email or direct or Google ads happen within that last seven day window. And what happens is Google uh, GA UA has a uh, basically a customer journey, but because it doesn't do a look back window where it tries to see when that first action happened it doesn't have the ability to kind of update that stuff going backwards. So as an example, Google ads has a look back window where if you click on an ad on the first and then by the 10th you convert, it'll actually give credit to the date of click. Whereas Google Analytics, both versions, or actually GA usually, gave credit to the date of conversion. Whereas GA UA is more of a data-driven attribution model. So it actually gives credit based on the user journey and when that customer took action and when the actions and the events took place. So because again, it's event-based, right? You can track different actions across the site and it's non-linear. It doesn't need to be only going forward. It actually has to really be dynamic and look at data from the past. The challenge with that becomes a, a bit of an information load where we get cookied, you know, cached information from them to the API and the information doesn't match what's in there now because it matched when it was sent through. But now because it's dynamic, the, the numbers have changed. So I would say that, you know, Google Analytics GA4 is moving towards 
a similar model to Google and ad Google ads where it is dynamic. It does have a long look back window and the information can change and be corrected and be updated based on what Google's finding. Whereas GA UA was definitely more linear and did not have the flexibility to go in and make corrections or to go in and add those variables that Google was seeing or to add different details based on that user journey from a different date of orient orientation. And so I would say, yes, the, the methodology you're talking about, the tracking methodology, it all changed with GA4 and it does complicate things a little bit when it comes to really kind of understanding how things look over time. And speaking of, thank you, Brian. Thanks, Dan, great question. Speaking of how things look over time, um, we've got a lot of customers who rely heavily on historical data. And so, you know, there, there's this question about, is there a way to stitch together historical GA3 data and GA4 data into one dashboard seamlessly within tap clicks? Can you touch on that one, Brian? Sure, so the key word there is seamlessly. Um, so how you have to do it, and it, it's a really great function and great feature. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm a visual guy, so let me pull up my tap clicks instance so I can kind of showcase this a little bit, if that's okay. Um, so I think great. it is a very visual topic. Let me pull this up real quick here. Um, yeah, I'm always, I have a hard, hard time just talking to people. I, I like, I'm a show and teller. I was always popular in show and tell. So <clears throat> Netflix came out with a, a solution for what you're asking on this question. And it's actually a very impressive solution because the original challenge when the a API was released was that there's a lot of information um, out there. I'm going to try to find my analytics test. Here we go. There's a lot of information um, out there where you know a lot of clients have Google Analytics and GA4 implemented at the same time. You I mean Google Analytics GA4 has been available for over, over two years, if not even more than that, because it had a different name originally. It was like uh, mobile and web, but they've migrated that to being Google Analytics GA4. But these data sets have been collecting for years. And what we found is that as people tried to build these channels where they collected data, showed this data point together, is what they what would find is that the sessions and, and revenue and transactions would duplicate. But it was just enough to where it wasn't, you know, 50, 50, it was like 50, 55, 45, right? But the variables were a little bit off. So people were questioning like, why is this number not quite 50%? Why is it duplicating? Well, the, the reason is because when you take Google Analytics and Google Analytics J4 sessions and you combine them in a, in a channel, you double up all those metrics that have been sitting there working together for the last two years. So Taplix came up with a really ingenious way called data boundaries <coughs> where you set the date of truth. So Google Analytics, for example, in my instance, I have set up from 2013 to 2023, uh, July 31st. So anything after August 1st, for me, in my instance, I consider the source of truth to be Google Analytics GA4. And why that's important is because it creates a clear separation in time when those data points can measure through. Now, the one other thing to think about is that if you have your sessions, your transactions, and your revenue in place, you will see um, some artificial growth in certain areas. And that's because the way that Google Analytics tracks things is smart enough to give credit where it's due, but also recognize where that session should be lying, right? So as an example of this, um, we had a client who um, did not enable a automatic redirect on their confirmation page. They're an e-commerce client. You go to their site, you make a purchase, and at the end of that uh, purchase, there's a confirmation page. Pretty standard. But what they did not do is redirect that thing, that confirmation page to the home page. So if you were to open up your browser after you made a purchase, it would reload that confirmation page, which would trigger Google Analytics UA to fire a second conversion with a second conversion value. And we told the developers that they needed to fix it for over two years, and they just never got around to it. Then Google Analytics GA4 rolls out, and we're looking at the numbers, and we're saying, well, why is this so different? Well, come to find out, Google Analytics GA4 was smart enough to recognize that that session that was reloaded and the transaction data refired was actually a duplicate because that session event had never gone back to the home site, and that user had never navigated through the process. <clears throat> so they were able to recognize the funnel had not been engaged and they were deprecating the duplicate numbers out of my report in GA4. So why that matters 
is because if you're looking at your sessions in a straight line, you're trying to look at your, your overview, your, your, your curves, right? You may find that the curves do not necessarily align correctly or may show an artificial lift of around 10 to 15% in sessions or transactions or revenue. And you may be curious like, wow, I did great. I must have done a really great job that, that, that period of time. And you have to be sure to recognize that it might not be that you did an extra good job, but that the data is a little bit different and how it looks is a little bit different, how the data represents is a little bit different because it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, as Angela and I often joke about this on different webinars we've done, it is like a gala apple versus a Honeycrisp apple. Sure, it's in the apple family, but it's not necessarily the same product. And so you really need to make sure you're aware of what that session means and the differences. So you can talk to your client about it, or if you are, if you have clients, of course, and really recognize that there is going to be a natural lift that you can account for in your measurement. And you should probably discount when you're looking for overall growth year over year. But the data is available. And then to showcase kind of how that looks, and I think I have a report open, but maybe I need to go to a different one. I had one open. Let me see if it's still... Okay, I'll just open a new one as an example here. Uh, GA, breakdown. So when you do build a widget that has the ability to look at the data over time um, and you're leveraging that data, you wanna make sure you're one, it's a channel. So you need to make sure you're looking at your channels. Um, and that would be in this case, my Google Analytics aggregation. And so like for sessions, transaction and revenue, as we're looking at that, um, looked over time, what you'll notice on these is as we have this laid out over a longer time frame, um, let's do this case the last year, you know, there is a situation where you may see that, you know, as July starts coming around, um, you see artificial, you know, this is obviously during January, you see artificial lifts in the overall uh, views and what is being, you know, recognized. So let's look at this by month here. I will put that in. So yeah, for example, you have March, you have February, you have your sessions, you know, reporting here. So for April, May, June, and then for me, July is kind of my kickoff. So July is when the sessions start to change, um, numbers start to change, and obviously this is a demo data. You can't look at this as an actual timeline, but if you're looking at this as one of those widgets, you're going to start seeing that the metrics that you're bringing in aren't necessarily matching 100%. So to answer the question directly, I would say a seamless transition you need to be make sure you're aware of what seamless means in that situation because it will be a little bit discrepant and you will see some data discrepancies based on the the overtime but you it's still valuable data that you can leverage together but i would say just be mindful of what it is you're stitching together and the differences and i think brian it's really important to to point out and i think you said at the start of of this webinar we're, we're moving to a cookieless society um yep. and ga is not tracking 100 not that it ever really did because there's still certain cases where it didn't but i'd say Correct. that ga fours now more hands are more tied than it ever has been in terms of what those figures that it does show so yep. you may see drop offs you may also see inflation though based on whether or not i think there's like predictive modeling now that it kind of can sort of guesstimate some of that as well so in terms of like for like yes same product owner but still fundamentally different platforms. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've seen that too. We had a client <clears throat> where they had WooCommerce and we pulled all their data for a month uh, in WooCommerce and we compared it to Google Analytics GA4. And, you know, originally that GA4 instance was, was set up where they had not customized the, um, the code implementation for e-commerce and the numbers were like half. So you look at WooCommerce, look at GA4, the revenue is half. And it's because they didn't customize the back end, so they were only tracking one product. So if you had a product order that had six products, <clears throat> the system was counting the one product and not the rest of them. So the order value was different, the revenue was different, and so this client was freaking out. Little to be known, we got on with the developer and they said, oh, I didn't realize I had to do anything. So they, they had never changed any of the back end coding. All they did was update the pixel. And you know it's really important that people who are implementing GA4 recognize that it's not just a copy, carbon copy. It's not just an upgraded version, like it's a whole new code set. So if you are having your developer implement the new GAUA measurement ID, be mindful of the fact 
that you definitely want to make sure you are getting um, enough data that's accurate and that your code's being updated with your revenue to really have that up. So there's one element there. The second, which is what Dan was talking about, is that we are seeing once GA codes are fully implemented, everything's right and correct, um, there's still a 10 to 12%, <clears throat> upwards of 15% discrepancy between the revenue and the transactions that are recognized on GA4 versus the website. And it's not that that transaction didn't happen. The website still caught the transaction. It's still, you, you fulfilled it. But GA4 can't see that. And the reason why is when GDPR yeah. is in play, users have the opportunity to opt out and say, no, I don't want to be tracked. And when they do that, it turns off your Google Tag Manager and your consent you know, protocols come into play. And that you know, Google Tag Manager basically goes into a, a nullified state for that session. And so that user can go in and buy and make a, make a purchase and you don't actually have that data be tracked. And we've had clients go, well, I don't like that. I wanna make sure I have a one-to-one -one measurement. I wanna make sure everything is, is apples to apples measurement. You know, I wanna make sure it's there. And I can, I can imagine someone who is you know, OCD trying to figure out like why one-to-one -one isn't matching and just going crazy with it. And it is one of those things where as marketers, we all have to come to the grips that <clears throat> GDPR has made that no longer an option in our environment. Um, there will never be a one-to-one -one comparison when it comes to data. And we all have to kind of recognize that, yeah, there's some situations where you can do a little bit better to help that. Enhanced conversions with Google ads can help that a little bit. Um, making sure your conversion API is set up in Facebook can help with that a little bit. You can recapture some of this data by voluntarily giving the systems first party data back into their system and says, oh, you missed this. Let's give that back to you. Um, so you can do that in a way, but just be mindful. It will never be one-to-one. -one. Not that it ever was, as Dan said, but it's even worse nowadays. Um, but with the discrepancies, I did want to pull up a couple of examples that I thought were interesting. Um, you know, the discrepancies between the systems can be quite stark. And Dan actually has a really good example of this as well. But we, when we look at the data inside TapClix, it is important to recognize that one, the data in GA4 is discrepant in a way because it has a look back window and that data is always constantly updating. So if you're looking at GA versus GA, you know, tap clicks versus direct instance, you will see some data variance. And that's just a thing because of the way that the system looks back. And actually our the team members on the team can express that a little bit more accurately than I can. But this is an example of the U, UA to GA4 differences. Um, in this client instance, and I, I've uh, pacified the client name for anonymity, um, but you can see the revenue in this situation. This is a single day um, with 17,629 for Google Analytics. Uh, transactions was 160. But with GA4, um, that same data set was only collecting around 15,600 and transactions was 136. So you can see the difference when you have a cookie list environment and um, that system cannot track it based on those cookie permissions versus GA UA. Second example, this example, again, a single day, they did $258,000 in revenue with 930 conversions, whereas GA4 was showing $231,000 with 836 transactions. Now you can understand if you're looking at this number on December 2nd, you start using GA4 data and December 1st, you use GA UA, you're going to see a discrepancy in your numbers where your revenue is going to do this and then go down. And you're going to go, whoa, what happened? Why did it go down? And if you're trying to compare that as a widget that is a blended data set, it's going to show potentially a either a scary number where you're seeing a large drop in revenue or a large drop in transactions, or it's going to show maybe an artificial lift depending on your guys' site and how the overall attribution is working. But it's one of those things where it is uh, something you need to be aware of. And then the last example, or last two examples, are more session and user base. So you can see GAUA had 800 sessions with, or 800 new users with 1400 sessions, whereas GA4 had 812 users for the same time frame. So more users tracked, and in this case, 1500 sessions, again, a little bit more sessions tracked. Um, this is all different clients, obviously, so the numbers aren't gonna match going down the list. Uh, and then example four is gonna be one where 1400 new users versus 1200. 1800 sessions versus 1700. So this is just meant to showcase that the numbers in GA versus UA, GA versus UA um, are not close enough to where you should expect it to be a smooth line across time. If you're looking at trends, the numbers are going to be somewhat inflated. 
um, you're going to start to recognize that you know certain metrics are showing more aggressively than others, and it has to do with the attribution, it has to do with the data, it has to do with how things are basically represented. Uh, Dan, you have some really good examples of this too. Can you talk about some of the discrepancies? Um, yeah, and obviously, absolutely. Angela, you kind of deal with the real technical stuff in the back end as as well as Catherine as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can I can talk about that really quickly. I just wanted to um, just stick to the the point the one question where can you integrate seamlessly between GAUA and GA4? Um, I think yes, but you have to bear in mind some of the you know the risks with that. You can see drops, especially in some of your core KPIs, revenue transactions and conversions. You may see uplifts in the sessions, so you've got to kind of guide the narrative with your clients as much as possible as well and your stakeholders. Um, so with, with that, I will just share a couple of other examples as well where we see difference in data and and why it's important to understand this when we talk about the blending as well. Um, so let me just share my screen. <clears throat> can someone confirm if that is sharing? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. You're good. Cool. So let's, let's dive in really quickly. So we're looking at just one uh, property here. Um, and just to give a little bit of background, we've got two types of connectors here at Taclix. Some of you will be aware we've got our traditional stored connector, which essentially pulls the data um, from the API every single day. That day of data will go into our data warehouse solution in the back end. From there, that data can be manipulated via channels, calculations, et cetera. So stored, pulls daily. That's that's kind of the key difference. We also have our live call data, which is, so this top widget here is live call. This bottom widget is stored. So stored runs daily. We pull for the previous day, add it on, right? Live call pings the API directly from, from that given time frame that you've set in the parameter of, of the widget build. So why is that important to know and what are the core differences? So we get a lot of clients saying to us, the data that we are pulling doesn't match the UI. So I just want to explain that a little bit. So when we look at our live core connector here, we can see we're breaking this data by day. We're using the exact same dimensions. We're using only the property data view in our stored connector. We're just looking at the one property in the live connector. We've got a total of 3,050 sessions and 2,612 users, right? So that is the API total. That is what you'll see in the UI, that figure. However, if we were to download this data and count those lines up individually, we, we don't see that. We see a different value to what's here. So what is what, what GA is doing and what they're really clever at doing um, is they're taking that, as Brian said earlier, that user session journey and they're deduplicating it across that seven day look back window. So where we see, I'm just seeing if I can load the right one here. So where we see, you know, the total amount of traffic, when we break it up line by line, we actually have a different figure to this because somebody may come through paid search and then two days later return either organic or direct. Broken down, we'll see two, a session there and a session there. But holistically, and when it's summed up, we'll have just one session, uh, one user and one session, sorry. So that's just some key differences just to bear in mind. So... Why does that matter when we look at a stored connector? And why does that matter when we're talking about channel blending? Well, stored connector, we're pulling that data every single day. We're getting that snapshot. So if we were just to scroll down here, we we pulled the 30th on the 1st of December, we pulled the 29th on the 30th, so on and so forth. So we are pulling those snapshot days. So our figures can look a little bit different. Now you might see here, we've got 3,016 versus 3,050 in the live. However, when we do download this data and we just sum up those lines individually, we, we do actually have matching figures here for the sessions and users across those two, those two connections in that example, right? Now that's not the same for every single breakdown. So why do why does the breakdown matter? Why do the dimension breakdowns? Why are they important? So if we were just to take a look at, I am going to do page path, I think. Just because the difference is a little bit more, um, a little bit more obvious. So let me just make this the same, just for the purpose of this. 
So I want dates and page path. So we're breaking it down. We've got 1,200 rows of data from GA's, GA4's API. And we are seeing a total of 3,050 sessions. Now, again, same example. We downloaded these row by row, added them up. We wouldn't actually get this. We'd probably get a slightly higher figure. When we look at it from a daily pull point of view, i.e., so these are the exact same rows of data, right? Same rows. And we see here we've got 72 for the home page on the first of the uh, first of November. We've got 72 home page, first of December, November. When we add them up, actually our total sessions is here is, is 5,356. That's a much bigger increase than what we saw just at the property level broken up by day because we're going down that a dimension level where there's more user sessions taking part on a website at the page level than there is just on each individual day. So that is really important to bear in mind when we do data blending and when we're trying to blend seamlessly. We want to make sure we take our data from the same levels. So if we're, we want to blend GA, UA data with GA4 um, data, we want to make sure we're taking it from, for example, the page path level, the page path data view at the same time, because that's a one to one ratio when we're looking at when we're pulling that data, because we're pulling it at that level. If we just wanted to report at the top level property, and I know some clients, that's all that they want to do. Count level in GA uh, UA terms will be this, be this fine as well. So that's just some things to bear in mind. So even though we are different to the UI, it's actually explainable because of the way that we're past the data, but also the way in which GA dedupes that data and cleans it up as well. So like I say, people think this is the total and this is what the number should be. Add up these lines individually, you will get different results. Add up those lines individually by day and you'll even get more big, uh, bigger discrepancy in results. So it just it's just changing, and it's just that GA just cleans it up now, whereas we get it from the lowest level. So are we? I don't think it's fair to say it's wrong. It's more that we are past that through the API, and because of the way that we sum up the data here, it's kind of it is the more true reflection, I'd say, because we're not cleaning it up either. So this is more of a raw intake of that data as well. That's a good um, point there, Dan. What yeah. would you consider to be the source of truth? Because I, I presented this information to a client you know, last week and she was kind of flabbergasted and she's like, well, what's true? Like, what do I look at as a real number? Like if Google Analytics is, is even not even summing up to the number total, like how do I know what's true? How would you, how would you approach that? I think it's a really difficult answer, question to answer because of the compliances that, that are being brought in at the moment with GDPR and data protection, et cetera. So like your source of truth really could be your first party data. So I know a lot of clients at the moment, they've sort of transitioned, still having GA in the background to show website performance, but transitioned to actually looking at the back end of their website, um, their WooCommerce, their Shopify stores, and using the data there because that's that first first hand party data, which, um, which isn't necessarily affected by cookie policy in the same way because it's not collecting the PII, it's just collecting that that fulfills sale, that revenue. So that you can kind of take results from different places and blend it here in TapClix as well. There is a bit of a, a benefit to doing that. Um, we do have WooCommerce, we do have Shopify. I think we might have WordPress. I could be wrong. Catherine will probably share it with me for being wrong. Unfortunately, um, no WordPress. I mean, be no, nice no WordPress. No WordPress as of yet, though. If you have requests for it, get it into your CRM or into our portal and we can evaluate it. So, so th there are ways in which you can take other source of truth and bring that data into the tap and, and kind of tell your own story. I think the, to answer your question, Brian, I think the idea of one source of truth is gone because everyone has to rely on different data sets now. That's a hard pill for people to swallow. It's, it, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of clients who have expressed this to me. Um, but they also have some benefit in what we can offer them as well to kind of get that. And I will also add, it's not just connections, connectors we have that are set up. We also have our smart connector feature to ingest data from sources that do maybe don't have an API. So there are things that we can do to kind of tell your, to tell your data story as well. 
That's helpful. That, thank you very much. Um, I want to chime in just very, very quickly, take a second to remind folks that, you know, Taplex. So why do we partner with Brian at Smart Tech? Because we partner with experts in the industry, people who deal with these kinds of questions, this type of setup, specifically with tap clicks, um, every day. So it's important that you all know that um, Brian and his team are definitely here to help you. Your CSM is here to, to be sort of the, the, the you know, face of the customer, of you coming internally and telling our teams what you request, what your needs are, um, reaching out to partners like SmartTech to make sure that you have the support that you need. Um, and of course, um, leveraging folks like Catherine with so much knowledge. Uh, I want to make sure everybody knows that we do have you know, our knowledge base um, that is available for you to take advantage of when reading up on, hey, how do I how do I overcome this particular challenge with GA4? Um, and then also, of course, we have templates built out. We have done a lot of work to just try so hard to make sure that this is a seamless, as seamless as possible um, of a migration for all of you. So if you have additional questions, you know, make sure that you are reaching out to your CSM. I believe that um, for most of you on the call today, your CSM happens to be Dan Sandbrook. So um, you're really lucky. Dan has a lot of experience when it comes to GA4 um, and Google Analytics um, in general. So anyhow, thought I'd, thought I'd remind folks of a few things there. But team, can we dive into perhaps, um, I think data views would be a good topic um, we talked a little bit, we, folks just kind of touched on it, but how we organize the data and DIYs. Who would like to take that one? I can, considering they're mine. <laughs> Anyways, you know. Um, so data views in the terms of tap clicks. These are essentially predefined sets of data. So dimensions and metrics from Google Analytics 4 that we have you know, determine that is a valid API call that we can make and get the data returned to us. And we store it in the warehouse. Each data view is a new table in the warehouse. That's why they're considered different data views. Uh, we do that to control how much data comes through to ensure fetch times are, you know, not astronomical for you guys. So you guys can get data in a timely manner in order to report out to your end clients. Um, but we also understand that what we have built predefined may not meet everyone's use case, right? We don't have a predefined data view for transactional information. None of that, those item IDs or any of that information there is part of the predefined. Doesn't mean we can't get it for you, right? Just like you guys have been hearing people say, it's a very custom implementation. It's very much, you have to be hands-on with GA4. That comes with a lot of custom dimensions and custom metrics, custom channel groupings, things that you have to build out completely tailored to your setup and your needs. And we do support those things for you guys. So in our stored connector, we have a, um, how would you say it? We have an architecture in the back end that allows us to do what we call DIYs, do-it-yourself data views. Um, these are not necessarily do-it-yourself, but they are do-it-yourself in the nature that you as a client get to define how you want it to be built. There are limitations around that because, you know, it has to be an, a valid API call. You have to use um, the request composer to go about checking it to make sure that it is an accurate call. Um, but those are things that the CSMs and can coach you around. There is collateral for that on how to do those things on our knowledge base. So there are stuff out there for you to help with that process. But the big thing is, is it allows you to say, hey, Tapquist, none of your predefined data views have what I need. I need to see my transactions by, you know, and uh, transact transactions with my items that are being sold in those transactions. And I need to know what the revenue is for that or the conversions are for that. And we can work to build it out. You know what I mean? It's not, it doesn't take overly long. I think the turnaround time is somewhere inside a week. So that's super, super grand there. You don't have to wait for my engineering team to hard code it on the back end. Um, the professional service team is a clutch group there. They really knock that out of the park. Um, and that's something that the CSMs can walk you through. Um, now, when I say custom data view support, 
um, that is all just in store. But guess what? Dan mentioned we have two different types of connectors. Um, oh, balloons. <laughs> Sorry, guys. A little bit of an excitement for a Tuesday. <laughs> um, but we have two different types of connectors of which stored is one and that's the DIYs. The other one being our on-demand, uh, Dan referred to as our live connectors, right? So those are the ad hoc calls to the API. Those data sets are a little bit different and a little bit more flexible in that you don't have to reach out to us to get us a, get a custom data view built out or a DIY data view built out. There is in fact just a custom data view that custom data view allows you access to every dimension and metric that is standard in the API for Google Analytics 4, plus all of your custom stuff, your custom dimensions, your custom metrics, your custom channel groupings. They're all in there. And you can build out whatever data set you want so long as it's a valid API call. Now, if you don't know what is a valid API call or not, our on-demand connector, if you put things together and it doesn't work, guess what? You hit save on that widget, it's gonna give you an error message that says, hey, this combination is not a valid combination with the API, please remove whatever it might be. So there is error messaging built in there to help kind of instruct you to move you forward so that you aren't completely blocked. So that is the GA4 data views in stored, DIYs in stored, and then a little bit about our on-demand custom data set. All right. Love it. Um, always trying to come up with multiple solutions for customers. So thank you, Catherine. That's great. So I think um, I'm looking at time and I know that we only have about 12 minutes together. So let's take a few minutes and let's dive into, we've had some requests from folks wanting tips um, with respect to the, the GA um, uh, environment. And so I'd love to turn it over to Brian to kind of walk us through the GA environment, giving tips and, and kind of some narrative around that. Thanks, Brian. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's some important changes that have come to light here in the recent weeks uh, in regards to that. So I think it's you know really, really good to be able to kind of showcase that as well. So I'll share my screen and show some of the, the visuals here so people can see. Can anyone see GA okay? Yes, we can. All right. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of really big, important updates that are really, uh, are valuable for people to know, and I'll, I'll start with that because I think it's really, really uh, timely. So the first one is that Google Analytics has changed actually how they um, recommend that you set up GA4 in Google Tab Manager. And so when you get into Google Tab Manager, it's going to ask you to install uh, the tag, and it's going to ask for a Google tag now, not a GA4 implementation tag. And it's diff it's very different because instead of using the measurement ID, which you used to have to go to data streams, <clears throat> grab your measurement ID here, um, it's now actually using something completely different to install GA4 at the tag manager level, and that is the Google tag. So if you were going into your system, you go to admin, right? And you go into your admin backend properties and you go to data streams. This is where you're gonna find this uh, ID. So does the configure tag settings right here. And you're gonna see the G dash, which is in my case starts with a JF uh, or JRF. And this is the new um, Google tag that you need to implement into Google Tag Manager for you to be able to implement GA4 through Tag Manager. And it is a recent change within the last couple of weeks. Um, super important. It is something that a lot of people have had a really hard time understanding what do I actually put into the system and it's not very transparent about it. So it's one of the main things I really wanted to showcase on that. The second is just overall kind of navigation. Um, you can do a lot with the GA instance. What I typically recommend for GA is one, as you're building your reports out in, in tab clicks, there are a lot of reports that you can build that kind of meet the standard kind of purview of what you see from a data standpoint inside of Google Analytics, right? So I'm gonna pull up uh, one of these most common reports. So when I build a report in tab clicks, I try to make sure that I'm leveraging the data as I'm used to seeing it in Google um, and GA4. So things like new users, engaged sessions, uh, engaged rate, uh, engaged session users, like a lot of these are gonna be seeing things that you see immediately 
when you come into your Google GA4 and your clients are also seeing in these columns. Um, and so it is important to recognize that some of your reporting in GA4 um, is gonna have a very specific user, um, you know, a UI, for example, UX UI. <clears throat> and you wanna try to replicate that as much as you can inside of Tapflix. The other thing you can also connect is a lot of the different sources that have um, been able to be brought into Tapflix or not tablets in the GA4, pardon me. Um, so one of the references there, as, a, as an example, is you go to your admin settings again, you have the ability to bring in your Google Ads data, as well as your Merchant Center data, as well as your Google Search Console data. So for me, you know, having Search Console connected, as soon as I connected that up, the report section um, actually started to optimize for the ability for me to see some of my GA queries. So this is a nice function, and actually Dan had asked me about it earlier in the in the, in the uh, report, and I hadn't had a direct answer for him. But seeing, um, you know, what Search Console can bring in is really handy and really effective to be able to really understand what it is you're uh, showing on for organically, and then what your overall search traffic looks like, and how that data is being brought in. So if you don't have a fancy, you know, SEO tool that can, you know, preview your your Search Console data and help you understand what's working, what's not you do have the ability to import that into GA and start seeing some of those data points. The other things you can start looking at is things like purchase journey um, and session journey. So you can really start to understand what it is your client is going through and what it is the experience they're going through is. So as you get into GA, you have the uh, report snapshot real time, which I will hesitate and say that this isn't necessarily actual real time. It does have a uh, delay when it comes to conversions. And so there's a, there's a conversion lag, I'll say, when it comes to tracking. So real time is pseudo real time, I would say, just be mindful of that. But if you have more metrics that you wanna see, you wanna to navigate to the library. And once you get into the library, it'll give you different collections of reports and data that you can leverage. So one of those is gonna be business objectives. Another one is going to be life cycle, search console, users, and under the life cycle is where you're typically going to go in and find the template for things like checkout journey, conversions, e-commerce purchases, uh, organic search, in-app purchases, landing pages, promotions. And you may be used to seeing a couple of reports and you're like, man, I really wish I had this report that I used to have in Google Analytics. Likely, you're going to see that a lot of that data is sitting in one of these templates. Um, and if it's not, you can create custom, you know, views, obviously. So for in this example, I can drag checkout journey into my engagement or into my user acquisition baseline, allowing us to really understand what it is um, that you're, you're, you're showing, right? And so once you drag that from the library into your system, it'll take it from a template mode and bring it into a view where you can actually leverage this um, going forward. Um, so let's go back to our report. So now as you bring in those data points, you have your acquisition, engagement, you should start seeing checkout journey right here on the side. And so a lot of people have been uh, having challenges recognizing how to use the navigation of GA4. And I would say these library widgets can be really, really helpful in helping to understand some of the basic events. Um, the other thing I will say is that events in GA4, um, when you set up the events, it's typically best to set it up in Google Tab Manager. There is a function where you can set it up inside of GA4. What I have found is that it is almost impossible to edit and almost impossible to troubleshoot to understand what it is that's making that fire and if it's firing correctly. Whereas in Google Tag Manager, you have the ability to actually go through a preview mode and recognize, you know, are, am I, I'm going through a, a transaction and I wanna recognize if I click on this button, does this actually track an event? Well, you can see that event fire in the preview tool inside of the tab manager, but you cannot see that preview, for example, in Google Analytics. So events can be a bit of a tricky uh, thing to set up for yourself, um, especially if you're trying to do it in the system. You may set up an event and not realize what it was firing on. So I personally recommend all events are set up through tab manager. It is what Google recommends as well, but there is a functionality, a functionality to bring it into uh, GA4 as a, you know, just a manual kind of effort. Um, but it can be more challenging when you're doing that. The other thing you can look at when it comes to advertising is recognizing the difference between total revenue, purchase revenue, 
and uh, I think it's um, ad revenue, you have the ability to track AdSense inside of uh, your Google Analytics. So when you're doing purchase revenue, that's your actual transaction revenue from your e-commerce site. When you have ad revenue, that's not your revenue from your paid ad. It's actually your AdSense, your Google AdSense ad revenue. And then the total purchase revenue is, or total revenue is all those rolled up into one metric. Um, the other one you want to look at when you're doing some reporting is uh, recognizing the difference between your um, between your acquisition, your channels. So if you're doing a traffic report, for example, um, if you see cross network under the cross channel here, that's actually Pmax on Google Ads. It's not a organic and direct, you know, uh, session that was you know blended together. It is strictly Pmax is considered cross network. So as you're looking at your numbers, you know, cross network is something you will see populate if you have Google ads running. Um, and then, you know, that's one, one element. The other thing is really kind of recognizing um, some of the setup functions and like things like um, referral exclusions, for example, and being able to get those referral exclusions out, um, be able to, you know, kind of optimize your account so you can get rid of different filters where, you know, say you have a Stripe, for example, and all of your conversions are being given to Stripe. Um, there's ways you can come in the back end look at your data filters and make sure that you're filtering different data out um, and doing referral exclusions on that as well. Um, and off the top of my head, I don't know where the referral exclusions are. Just trying to navigate through, I have to do a little bit more research and figure out where that's at. But regardless, um, I do recommend, you know, taking some time to look at your admin settings and understand what it is that you're reporting, what you can change and where the functionalities are that you can update and modify. Because there's a lot in here that you can set up and as you're looking at your attribution, your, defin your channel definitions, um, it's a pretty important thing to be able to kind of leverage. The other thing I would say is that with custom dimensions and custom uh, calculations, those are data points that TapClix can bring in. Um, and so if you end up creating new dimensions, for example, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who use um, uh, Rollworks, for example, or another ABM platform where it brings in data intelligence from Bambora or from Clearbit. Those data intelligence, like what company came to your site, what the uh, domain was, what the URL was, all that data can be brought in as custom metrics into your Google Analytics. Um, and if those data metrics are brought in and they're now custom metrics you can create reports off of, those can typically be imported into TapClicks as well, which is really handy. Um, is there any other, uh, I guess, maintenance or not maintenance, but uh, navigational elements that people have questions about? I would say, um... With about a minute left, Brian, we're, I, I think we should probably end it there. I don't see any questions at this moment with respect to this particular piece. Um, I will say, uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A. We can definitely get back to you after today's webinar. Uh, reminding you again that you have a client success, a customer success manager here at TapClix. And so reach out with additional questions. Um, they can go ahead and, uh, you know, answer some of those for you, pull in those appropriate folks to get um, answers for you and to get you the help that you need to ensure your success. Uh, so please do reach out to Dan or whomever your success manager is. We can even set you up with Brian and his team for one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, things like that. So um, do reach out. We're here to help. Uh, all right. So we are just about at time. If there is nothing else at this particular moment, I would say um, I just want to thank you all again for your time. Taking an hour out of your day with us means a lot. So uh, reach out if you need anything. We're here for you. Anything else from anybody on the team? All right. Good. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone. That's our session. Thanks. Take care. Bye -bye. Cheers.